Town, and it's wonderful to be here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Travis Freeman, and I am originally from Corbin, Kentucky, which is southeast of here. And uh, I graduated from Corbin High School in 1999, went to the University of Kentucky. Once I graduated from UK, I went to uh, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, got a master's and a PhD. And I currently teach at the University of the Cumberlands, a part-time professor there. And then I travel and, and do events like this um, all over the, the country. And uh, this morning or this afternoon, as we get started, I want to ask each and every one of you to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to think about this question. If somebody were to come in here and tell you that what you see right now is what you're going to see for the rest of your life, how would you react? How would you respond if, if someone told you that you would never see the light of day again? Would you be angry, bitter, feel sorry for yourself? This afternoon I'm going to share with you how I answered that very question. You can look back up here at me. Uh, growing up in Corbin, I, I lived a typical all-American kid kind of life. My family and I, we were involved in the community. We were uh, involved in, in everything going on. I was involved in athletics and academics. I was really living a typical all-American kid kind of life. But at the age of 12, all of that began to change. I woke up one Wednesday morning late in the month of June 1993 and waking up I had a severe migraine headache. Now that wasn't all that unusual for me. I had suffered from headaches as a child but there was something different about this one and that is that it would not go away. And for the next nine days I had a migraine headache that everything I did made it hurt worse. Whether it was light, sound, movement, talking, everything I did made this headache hurt worse. I went to a couple of different doctors during that time and they said it's just a headache. It'll go away just as quickly as it came. I woke up on the morning of the 10th day and the doctors are right, the headache was gone, but at this point there was a different problem, that is that my left eye was beginning to hurt. My parents looked at it, they didn't see anything wrong with it, they said hang out today and if it's still hurting this afternoon then we'll take you to the eye doctor. My mom came home from work that afternoon and not only was my eyes still hurting but it was beginning to swell. So we went to the eye doctor and he did an eye exam. I had hit myself in the eye the night before. He didn't see anything wrong with it, so he said, hang out, go home, put some ice on it, and it should be better by in the morning. Well, I woke up that next morning and it was Saturday, July the 3rd, 1993, and not only was my head, uh, eyes still hurting, not only was it still swollen, but the area right around my left eye was beginning to swell. 
So we went back to the eye doctor and this time he looked deep into my head, behind my eye, and he saw that I had a massive infection. He said, we've got to get this kid to University of Kentucky Hospital. So they rushed me to UK and admitted me into the uh, ER there and began to run all kinds of different tests, doing CAT scans and MRIs and spinal taps, trying to figure out what the infection was, where it was, and what they could do about it. And eventually they discovered that I had what was called cavernous sinus thrombosis. And what that is, is it's a severe sinus infection that reaches the most deadly state that a sinus infection can reach. The doctors told us that 70% of the people that have what I had die, and of the 30% that survive, most of them live in a persistent vegetative state. They said that I was only the second case in the world, number two in the world, where it's ever just affected the eyes. They admitted me into the pediatric ICU unit there at UK and um, began to pump my body full of ma massive amounts of antibiotics. I said, normally we don't give a full grown adult this much medication, but we're just trying to save his life. And Saturday, July the 3rd turned into Sunday, July the 4th. The doctors realized that the antibiotics weren't helping the infection. They weren't phasing it at all. So they decided they were going to do a surgery, what they said would be an hour and a half surgery that ended up lasting over four hours. While I was in surgery, my head was so swollen that you couldn't see my eyelashes. And my temperature topped out at over 106 and stayed there for three days. I can stand here this afternoon and tell you that I was literally laying on my deathbed. Medically speaking, there is no reason that I should have walked out of that hospital some 28 years ago. But there was a plan and a purpose to what was going on in my life. I came out of surgery and the doctors had saved my life, but I would never see the light of day again. In less than two days, in less than 48 hours, I went from perfect 20-20 vision to no vision at all. And I spent the next 17 days at the University of Kentucky Hospital. 17 days that changed everything about me. 17 days that literally turned my life upside down. As we came out of the hospital, we were given the name of a lady there in Lexington. We were told to call her that she would be able to help us. My parents and I, we had never been around someone who was blind. We didn't know what was going on. So I'd been home from the hospital a couple of days and my mom picked up the phone to call this lady. Now just so you know, I am an only child. I'm spoiled. And I'm mama's boy. And my mom, our, our family has just gone through this traumatic experience. She calls this lady, and the first thing out of her, her mouth was, Miss Freeman, you might as well face it. You no longer have a son. Travis is going to have to go off to the Kentucky School for the Blind, and he's going to have to learn how to live life in a dark, dark world and you will no longer be a part of it. Needless to say, she was not a ray of sunshine in our life. Not encouraging at all. My mom didn't know what to say, she didn't know what to do, so she hung up on the lady. But we were devastated. We were devastated. We had been told that this lady knew what she was talking about. We had been told that she was the expert, that she would be able to help us. So we made an appointment with Kentucky School for the Blind in Louisville. We went up there, toured their facility, spent time with them, told them our story. And at the end of our visit, they looked at us and said, Travis does not belong here. Travis needs to be in Corbin where he'll have his family 
his friends, his support system, and we are willing to help make that happen. So in the fall of 1993, I began at the Corbin Middle School as the first blind student to ever attend Corbin City Schools. But it was not easy. Like I said, my life was flipped upside down. And they began throwing all of this stuff at me. Travis, you've got to learn how to read Braille. You've got to learn how to get around by yourself. You've got to learn how to dress yourself. You've got to learn how to study by yourself. You've got to learn how to eat by yourself. You've got to learn how to do this and do that, do this and do that. And it was completely overwhelming. And so I began to set goals. And as I would achieve one goal, I'd move on to the next. As I would achieve that goal, I would move on to the next. And by the end of my seventh grade year of school, I had been quite successful at reassimilating myself into a normal flow of life. But there was still one thing in my life that was missing, and that was football. I played football in the fifth grade, the sixth grade. I was raised around the sport. I had a passion and a desire to be a part of it. My parents knew this, and so they went to our eighth grade football coach, Coach Ferris. And they said, Coach, we, we want Travis to have a part on the team. Maybe to work out with the team, get some exercise. So we don't expect him to play or anything. We just want him to be a part of it. Coach Ferris looked at my mom and he said no. He said if Travis Freeman does anything for this team, he's going to play. He said I figured it out. He'll be the center. So we have the guards on either side of him, the quarterback behind him. They'll help him to and from the huddle, line him up over the ball, and then tell him where his man is, whether he's left, right, or head up. Then once Travis snaps the ball to the quarterback and makes contact with his opponent, It'll be just like anyone else blocking. So in the fall, in August of 1994, I stepped foot on the football field as America's first blind football player. I played throughout the eighth grade, lettered four years of high school varsity football. Throughout my senior year of high school into my freshman year of college, I received nearly 90 different newspaper, television, radio, magazine interviews. I was featured on the NBC Today Show as well as Dateline NBC. This story about a blind football player in southeastern Kentucky had become a national story. Several years after that, though, I received a phone call that changed everything. It's from a lady named Tony Hoover, and Tony had lived in Corbin when I played football. I played one year with her son, Bram, and she called and said, Bram and I are going to be writing a screenplay. We're going to make a movie, and we want your life to be the inspiration. Now, when somebody calls you and says, hey, we're going to make a movie about your life, that's not something that you ever think will actually happen. But on October 24th of 2014, the movie 23 Blasts was released on 600 screens across the nation. It's now available on DVD and digital download. We, when I saw the, the movie for the first time, I quickly came to understand what that little phrase, loosely inspired by, actually means. I thought they did a great job of capturing the spirit of my story, but it wasn't the Travis Freeman story. And so along with the release of the movie, we published my autobiography, Lights Out, Living in a Sightless World. I'd been given this platform of a book and a movie, and I wanted to make a difference in the world. And so I started a nonprofit organization called the Freeman Foundation. And the Freeman Foundation exists to raise awareness of the needs and potential of people with disabilities. And we promote the truth that disability does not equal inability. A lot of the money that we raise goes to help us support two orphanages in Haiti that care for children with disabilities. We're talking about the lowest of the low. Haiti's the fourth poorest country in the world. And in that culture, people with disabilities are cast aside. 
So these children have no hope. They have no hope. We promote the truth that disability does not equal inability. And guys, the reality is each and every one of you have a disability. A disability is simply an obstacle or a challenge in your life that you have to overcome. We all have disabilities. It may be a physical disability. It may be that you struggle making friends. Maybe that you struggle in school, a difficult home life, or an economic situation. We all have disabilities. And what I want you to know this afternoon is that there is hope. There is hope that you can overcome the disabilities of your life. And for me, there were three things that helped me overcome my disability of blindness. First of all, there was faith. I had a belief in something bigger than myself, that there was a, a purpose for my life. There was family. I had a support system of family and friends and coaches and teachers that helped me. And, and guys, I know that there are teachers and coaches in this building that care about you. At least you have that. And then there was football. And football for me was more than just athletics. It was a way that I could fit in. It was something that I could do that, that I was just like everyone else. And I don't know what that is for you. It may be a sport. It may be art, music, writing. It may be academics, involvement in your church. But whatever it is that motivates you and challenges you to get out of bed in the morning, find that. Find it and pour yourself into it. Faith, family, and football. Those were the three things that served me well in overcoming my blindness. And I believe with all of my heart that they will serve you well as well. So now I'm going to ask, uh, I believe Miss Heath was going to help me with Q&A. So we're going to do some question and answer time and have a few questions. So if you, uh, if you want to ask something, feel free about my life, about playing football, about the movie, uh, about the foundation. If you have any questions at all, just feel free to, to shout them out. How did you play football? How did I play football? Um, I played just like everyone else did. I just made contact with the person in front of me and tried to stay between him and the football carrier. Other questions? Yes, are you still blind? Am I still blind? Yes. Um, I, you know, most people who are blind actually can see a little bit. Um, so they, they may have some light perception or even be able to see a little. Um, I have no light perception at all. Other questions? How did your mom give you directions to, to come, like come over here, or how did you learn how to navigate? Yeah, um, so I had, the, the question was, how did I learn how to navigate or, or follow directions and get around? Um, I had a lady named Patty Wheatley, and Patty is what's called an orientation and mobility instructor. And so she taught me how to use my cane, how to get around, um, and, and just gave me tips basically for how to navigate my life independently. Other questions? Do you know what caused the infection? Do we know what caused the infection? We actually don't. Uh, the doctors told us it could have really been anything, anything as small as a, a mosquito bite, um, but they really don't know ultimately what, what caused it. Other questions? Okay. 
the biggest thing I had to overcome in the last time I played football. Well, the last time I played football was the last game of my senior year in 1998. So that was 21 years ago, 23 years ago, uh, if I can do math. Um, the biggest thing, the hardest thing to overcome wasn't anything individual, it was everything at once. And so, so I lost my sight suddenly, and so I had to learn everything immediately. And so it just kind of, it was overwhelming. That's why I said I had to set goals and, and just focus on one day at a time. A few more questions. How did you react when you were told you How did I react when I was told that I would be blind? Um, I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember the first time I realized I was blind. Uh, I, I was, um, I had a lot of medication. They were keeping, keeping me somewhat sedated. Uh, but my, my parents um, have told me and have told the story that a couple days or a day or so after uh, we were told that I would probably never see again, they came into my hospital room to, to talk to me just to see how I was and how I was processing things. And um, they say that I looked at them and I said, I believe I will see again. But if I don't, I can't wait to see what God's going to do through this. And that's really been my attitude ever since then. I, I believe that God had a purpose for my blindness and that God was going to use my blindness. And he has. Other questions? How old are you now? I am 40. Okay. And can you see anything at all? Like no, no, I have no light perception at all. Uh, no, um, I, uh, so I, I'm married and I have a baby girl. Uh, we, we have a daughter who's almost three. And uh, so I, I spend a lot of time at home by myself during the day when Stephanie's at work. And uh, even uh, you know, with, with a child, with our daughter, um, I, you know, I watch her by myself all the time. I change diapers by myself. I, I bathe her. I, I do all of that fun stuff. So, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm very independent, and I can, can do, um, do really anything except drive. So let's do two more. To the Freeman Foundation, um, you can uh, go to our website, uh, travisfreeman.org, um, or I can give you some contact information and you can reach out to me uh, directly. Yeah, how do I know what, what time it is? So I use, let me put my lid on my water here. Um, I have one of these. How does everybody else figure out life these days? So I have an iPhone and every Apple product has um, what's called uh, voiceover on it. And what voiceover does is it reads the screen to me. So I'm gonna let you all hear this. So it's just reading the different apps to me. And so right there was the clock. It said, it said it's 1.29 p.m. Um, and then uh, I can do emails and text messaging and social media. Uh, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and uh, so I do a lot with my phone or my iPad or my computer. So, all right, guys, you all have been wonderful. So we, um, we have copies of the book and the movie here, and we have posters. Uh, so if you are interested in purchasing those, we take cash 
uh, check or card. We can take credit card. Uh, the, the, the books are 14, uh, the movies are 10, and the posters are 5. All of those uh, should already be autographed. So if you're interested, um, I will let uh, Miss Heath tell you all how to go about that uh, or exactly what we're going to do. So um, thank you all. You all have been wonderful. And who, I don't know who I'm giving this to. Oh, there you go. My pleasure. And uh, what a wonderful, inspiring story. Boys and girls, thank you so much. We'll see you all later.